It's my pleasure uh, next to introduce somebody who really doesn't need an explanation or an introduction in this uh, group, but uh, Rick Fuentes is uh, Colonel and Superintendent of the New Jersey State Police. He's led that organization for almost 10 years now as the, as the Chief Executive, and he's one of the uh, few State Police Colonels in America that has both the Superintendent responsibility as well as the Director of the Office of Emergency Management, which uh, has been uh, filling a lot of his days in, uh, in the last couple of, of weeks. Rick is a, a leader at the national level in terms of uh, certainly law enforcement, intelligence, and information sharing. He serves on the U.S. Uh, Department of Justice, uh, the Attorney General's uh, uh, Federal Advisory Committee on Information and uh, Intelligence on Global, uh, and the Criminal Intelligence uh, Coordinating Committee. And uh, Rick is, uh, is going to come up here and uh, introduce our uh, keynote, right? Thanks, Tom, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Tom sort of sprung on me that he wanted me to talk a little bit about Sandy, but I really don't want to stray away from the object uh, of my attention here, but uh, Tom is right, about 50 or so years ago, somebody had the bright idea of weaving in the role of emergency management under the superintendent of state police, and that was back during the civil defense days. How many people here actually remember civil defense prior to the, uh, to the phrase Homeland Security? That's when, under the threat of an atom bomb, that's what they called it back then, under the threat of an atom bomb, you had to crawl under your desk uh, to avoid getting harmed, which incidentally left me with an absolutely twisted misperception of the capability of fireballs, okay? Uh, but uh, I think the government sort of did the right thing by saying, crawl under your desk, this way you won't know what hit you, you know? And so, but, uh, you know, as a result of that, uh, superintendents starting back in the 1960s and then moving forward did have that responsibility. And uh, it's been particularly a busy time under uh, Governor Christie, not just because he brings a particular public persona to each one of these crises, and I've had 19 states of emergency since becoming superintendent, uh, and about seven or eight of those, maybe eight now with Sandy, uh, have been uh, with Governor Christie's uh, administration. Nobody messages like him, and everybody knows that. You don't need to watch Saturday Night Live. Uh, he does that all the time, and he is very, very aggressive when it comes to the Regional Operations Intelligence Center, uh, the ROC. And just when I thought that the ROC had exceeded its capabilities or had attained a high level of capability in addressing matters of all hazards, all crimes, a lot of doing criminal products, terrorism type products, uh, the way it's weaved into emergency management now has proved to be just uh, uh, unbelievable and way beyond my expectations. And just. And just to give you, and, and Chris is going to like this, because not knowing I was going to be talking about this, uh, Tom, in advance of the introduction, I asked Chris, well, what did, what did The Rock do in terms of factoids uh, during Hurricane Sandy? And they sent out about, I think it was between October the 26th and November the 21st, about 311 notifications to more than 9,000 uh, recipients from 2,000 agencies. And those notifications, situation reports, what we call sit-stat updates, uh, we're basically letting everybody know the weather report at a particular point in time, and these came out all day long, uh, what the utility situation looked like, what the power outages look like, uh, as well as the governor coming out every day and holding uh, calls to at least 500 uh, public safety and elected officials around the state, innumerable press conferences, many of which I had to stand behind with uh, a little bit of arthritis in my lower back. But he messaged this stuff out like, uh, like nobody I've ever seen, and I think that is really responsible for the fact that of a storm of this nature, uh, the loss of life was 39. Uh, and I think when you look at other such type storms around the country where the loss of life was much higher, people here in New Jersey listened. And I think the governor does a good job of convincing people uh, that what he's saying is, is correct and people listened. Uh, I'm sharing the room here with many people that we worked with uh, during that storm, uh, not just the people out of here, the commanders from, uh, uh, from the ROC, uh, but Matt Wilson from Investigations, Armando Fontour, Chief Ambrose, uh, Police Director DeMeo, uh, were all very much affected uh, uh, by this storm and just performed absolutely admirably. You know, OEM is 
sort of an orchestra leader. Even if you look at across state departments or across the county or local OEMs, there's the drum section, there's the percussion uh, you know, section, strings, whatever the case may be, and it's the job of OEM not to be the individual subject matter expertise, but to make it all harmonized. Uh, and I think that's always the challenge of OEM, and, and, and I really do think it rose to uh, a level, but because of the team and some of the individuals that I just men uh, mentioned, and I'm deeply grateful. Okay, so I have sufficiently strayed from, uh, from the object of my attention here and the purpose uh, uh, of my being up here. Uh, I had a chance to talk to uh, General McCaffrey does not remember the meeting that we had some years ago. It was after he became uh, the drug czar and I was involved in some uh, operations that uh, dealt with shipments, uh, major shipments of narcotics. Uh, he was the drug czar at the time and he would often be the speaker at some events that I went to and he was very personable. Uh, somewhat disarming, very, very comfortable to, uh, to get into a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. And uh, under those circumstances, uh, you know you're dealing with, the, uh, with an individual who, who, who is more likely to say, please, don't give me a long introduction. But every time I hear that, I'm sort of driven to the anecdote uh, that I got uh, from Bob Mueller, head of the FBI, where on one occasion uh, he introduced uh, General Colin Powell. And he walked up uh, to the podium and he said, ladies and gentlemen, a man who needs no introduction, General Colin Powell. And of course, to a standing ovation, Colin Powell walked to the podium and said, thank you, Director. Uh, even though I may not need an introduction, it doesn't mean I don't want one. <laughs> so, so, General, and to the audience here, uh, you're going to get an introduction. It's going to be a little bit lengthy, but this is somebody whose history and importance to the country, I think, certainly deserves it. I have had the honor uh, over the years of introducing many men and women of note and importance to their community uh, and country, and on those rare and privileged occasions, someone of daring do, indeed, of whom it can be said placed a marker on the historical timeline of our country. One of those individuals was General H. Norman Schwarzkopf, Jr., whose father founded the New Jersey State Police on the, on the occasion of his in uh, induction into the New Jersey Hall of Fame and who was, during one of those events of historical note, the comrade in arms of the person I'm here to introduce this afternoon, General Barry McCaffrey. General McCaffrey was born into a military family, the son of Lieutenant General William Joseph McCaffrey, himself a Silver Star recipient and a combat veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Like his father, Barry McCaffrey was sworn into the service of his country on the plane of, uh, at West Point as a member of the class in 1964. He saw action in the Dominican Republic in 1966 and two tours in Vietnam, first as an advisor uh, to the Army of the Republic of Vietnam and then as a company commander uh, with the 1st Cavalry Division, during which he suffered significant combat-related injuries that kept him hospitalized for almost a year and during which he was awarded his country's highest honors for bravery under fire. I've heard a rumor also, which he just confirmed, uh, that he wanted to pursue a career in law enforcement and may have applied to uh, the LAPD after the Vietnam War, but the extent of his wartime injuries caused him to remain in the military, a choice that would continue to be of great benefit to our country. General McCaffrey's peacetime assignments included tours as an instructor at West Point from 1972 to 1975, Assistant Commandant at the U.S. Army Infantry School, Deputy U.S. Representative to NATO, Assistant Chairman Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Director of Strategic Plans and Policy for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Back in combat, during Operation Desert Storm, General McCaffrey commanded the 24th Infantry Mechanized, Mechanized Division, comprising more than 26,000 soldiers and 36 battalions. He had trained them well. The 24th, leading up to the beginning of combat in Desert Storm, was generally thought of as the best prepared division in the United States Army for desert warfare. Under General McCaffrey's command, the division conducted the famous left hook attack upon enemy forces 400 miles inside of Iraq. By the time of the ceasefire on February the 28th, his division had destroyed 360 tanks and other armored personnel carriers, 300 artillery pieces, 1,200 trucks, 25 aircraft, 19 missiles, and over 500 pieces of engineering equipment. The division took over 5,000 Iraqi prisoners of war. 
It is no wonder that General Schwarzkopf, while running the front office of Operation Desert Storm, made numerous references about then two-star General McCaffrey uh, in his autobiography, It Doesn't Take a Hero, for his speed and boldness and for what the U.S. News and World Report called leading the greatest cavalry charge in history. General McCaffrey's last command in the Army from 1994 to 1996 was that of the United States Southern Command, SOUTHCOM, the unified command responsible for U.S. military activities in Central and South America, a time when international drug production and smuggling was at its zenith. As a staunch advocate for those who served their country in the armed forces, General McCaffrey spoke up often for the rights of women and minorities in the Army, and it was during his last military position as head of SOUTHCOM that he created the first Human Rights Council and Human Rights Code of Conduct for the U.S. Military Joint Command. At the time of his retirement in January 1966, he was not only the most decorated general in the United States Army, he was also the youngest, having earned four stars, the Army's highest peacetime rank, in what can only be described as the hard way, boots on the ground. Of his 32 years in the military, he served 13 years overseas with four combat tours. Soon after his retirement, President Clinton appointed him to the position of Director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, as the nation's uh, drugs are, a position that he held for five years and during which he spearheaded the disbursement of more than a billion dollars to beef up the work of the Colombian Army. Not shying away from controversy, if common sense so dictated, General McCaffrey implemented anti-drug messaging in youth-oriented television shows and movies operating with a clear understanding that the imaging of drug use and its consequences in the entertainment media would have the greatest impact on the most at-risk adolescent and young adult populations. In the belief of those most informed of the role of the drug czar, General McCaffrey was the most committed and effective of his peers in that position. He has traveled extensively throughout the world as an official representative of the United States and as a frequent presence in the media. By last estimates, having appeared in more than 6,000 television stories and 15,000 newspaper articles. He is currently the president of his own consulting firm, B.R. McCaffrey Associates, based in Arlington, Virginia, providing strategic, analytic, and advocacy consulting services to businesses, governments, and international organizations. And he also serves as the national security analyst for NBC News. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce the recipient of two silver stars, two distinguished service crosses, and three purple hearts, one of this country's most distinguished and accomplished military and civilian leaders, General Barry McCaffrey. Tom O'Reilly, thanks uh, for the intro. Thanks for your leadership your career in law enforcement, and for coming to the Police Institute. And I'm, I'm delighted to be part of your program as you put energy and focus and, and all the things you can contribute to law enforcement. Uh, both Rick Frentwies and Ray Gadetti and the law enforcement people in the room, you know, uh, you know I remind Americans periodically it is astonishing uh, what this island of the rule of law, there's a handful of nations, the, uh, the British former colonies, you know, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the United States, where um, the country as a general statement looks up to law enforcement. They expect it to have a sense of integrity, courage, competence. Uh, we end up with people com competing, hundreds of them, to get into law enforcement positions. Uh, it's something we ought to treasure and remind ourselves that it comes uh, only with a lot of work. Uh, you know, I deal a lot with Mexico. I'm going to talk about Mexico. I love Mexico, the culture, the families, the spirituality, the hard work, but at the end of the day, they're public institutions, particularly law enforcement. Uh, you know, you, if you join the state police in some of these uh, states of Mexico, you're joining a uniformed criminal organization. Uh, so a nice young boy wants his mother to be proud of him. Uh, he deeply believes in Mexico and, uh, and the future, and he's joining an institution of such fallibility. Thank God for U.S. law enforcement. That goes from the top, the FBI, down to local uh, police. Uh, John Farmer, thanks for those uh, words. Rod Nightum, tremendously complicated uh, area. I tell people there's only two threats 
that I find credible in the coming 10 years or so that could nearly bring us to our knees. One is cyber terrorism and the other is biological warfare. Uh, the chemical, not so good a weapon, easy to do, we'll, we can talk about that. Uh, nuclear, mostly under control, mostly, most of the time. Uh, but cyber warfare and bio are things to take into account. I'm here with a lot of the, the uh, mutual link team. I'm proud to be associated with them. Mark Canton, our CEO, Colin McWay, Rob Wright, Beth uh, Clay did so much work getting us organized to uh, support this effort. I'm, I'm glad uh, what they're contributing to, uh, particularly the fusion centers around America. Ron Brooks, friend of uh, long standing, uh, the most wired cop in America, a real cop, I might add, uh, who's done such good for, uh, for trying to organize the, at national level uh, logical support for local law enforcement. Anyway, look, uh, let, me, uh, let me suggest this is what I do. I've got um, some slides that I uh, update periodically. And I say that because I, a good bit of what I've done over the, uh, since leaving government in 2001 uh, is use some academic or institutional hat. Uh, West Point faculty, uh, National Defense University, Council on Foreign Relations, Inter-American Dialogue, occasionally, rarely working for uh, a government uh, agency uh, outside of DOD. But by and large, what I've done is I look at national security issues, um, and I'm in and out of the, the international community, almost without exception, sponsored by a U.S. Joint Military Commander. I always play that down. I'm retired. I'm in civilian clothes. My orders read as a member of the West Point faculty. So I go look at international security situations uh, in an informed, objective, nonpartisan way, and then go back and testify to Congress, uh, deal with the media, and try and understand uh, these issues. I've also dealt with all the uh, home and security directors from the start. Uh, Tom Ridge, one of my heroes. Uh, Judge Chertoff was a remarkably intelligent, balanced, nonpartisan guy. Janet Napolitano has got a lot of time in public office left in front of her. Uh, they've gradually, painfully, as all of you in this room would know, built an institution. I went down and testified against starting DHS when it first came up. Because I, I told people it's going to be five to 15 years before you can build a new uh, institution. And by the way, when they did it, we left out of it the two institutions that had most dramatically failed, which was the CIA and the FBI. I say failed, uh, along with most of the media, governmental figures, and the armed forces. Uh, but we didn't see 9-11 coming, and, and logically, they were kept out of DHS. But I think now we're, we're into an era of DHS where this uh, essentially uh, third biggest department of government uh, is now bringing together and adding value and security to, to the American people. And it's addressing issues that are totally different. Uh, you know, we mentioned getting under your desk for atomic bomb blast. Now we're into a different area of threat to the American people. We do need new institutions. And we can talk about this. It's not just DHS. You need a public health service. You need a diplomatic corps. The sort of the standard joke inside Washington is the diplomatic corps core of the United States is smaller than the number of military bands. And by the way, none of what I present is an argument against the Department of Defense. But I will tell you, when you sort of back off the situation all of us in this room face and look at it, uh, you know, my argument in public is DOD is underfunded for the task that's been given since 9-11. It is 4.7 percent of GNP. That's it. So if you're looking at wars we've fought, you know, World War II was 36% of GNP, Korea 18%. Uh, this is a modest part of our national treasure uh, that we put in the DOD. And having said that, keep your data point, is it just under a trillion dollars and it's 2.4 million men and women in the active guard reserve and civilian components. And then you flip to the other side and you look at the institutions that are being asked to deal with these new threats, and it's 42,000 people in TSA, for God's sakes. And we're arguing that that's too much of an of a investment in resources? Yeah, I'll go home tonight at 8.34 on the Acela. 
I call it the transportation system for older business guys who'd rather be blown up than hassled. I mean, you could get on that train with a footlocker with a lit fuse sticking out of the top of it, and nobody would question you. But TSA was asked to address not just aircraft, which are remarkably safer today. Uh, I think almost to the point it's hard to imagine 9-11 as an, as an attack happening the same way. But TSA is supposed to be doing ferries and subways and uh, trains and, and things that require a very different uh, set of technology and intelligence and law enforcement uh, tools to deal with. Um, and, you know, e even things within DHS, the Border Patrol, when I started working that border issue with Mexico, 2,000 miles of frontier, this giant nation to our south, and for that matter, north, 5,000 miles of frontier, we had around 4,000 people in the Border Patrol. It's pathetic. 12,000 miles of land frontiers, the sea frontiers of the, you know, the Caribbean coast, Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico. The right answer I would tell each attorney general on the Border Patrol was 45,000 people. And the attorney generals would normally get outraged, budgetary concerns, nothing else. And they'd say, General, what are the analytical underpinnings to your argument? The underpinnings? I just made the number up. It was the size of the NYPD at max strength. How could you pretend to defend America's frontiers in cooperation with foreign law enforcement if you don't have a federal agency that has the muscle, the aviation, the technology, the training systems uh, to, to carry out their tasks? And, and so it goes on. One of the most effective organizations in the United States, bar none, is U.S. Coast Guard. You know, if you don't like the Coast Guard and the Boy Scouts, there's something un-American about you. <laughs> And you look at the Coast Guard, I think they're up now to something like 36,000 people with an aging maritime capability and aviation capability. They're under-resourced. That's not a U.S. Navy mission. You don't want nuclear attack submarines doing intercept operations on, on Colombian drug uh, smuggling fishing boats. You want to have a tool, a mechanism, and it should be primary law enforcement like the, as the Coast Guard is. Uh, but you've got to give them the tools to do their job. We got some problems, we've got to address, address them. Let me, with your permission, walk through some of these slides, and I'm gonna do it sort of quickly. They're available uh, electrons. I'm sure, Tom, you can hang them on your website, and um, they may, they've got some numbers there that I try and keep refreshed, uh, refreshed that'll be uh, helpful to the discussion. So I'm gonna walk through this thing uh, pretty quickly. I wonder if I'm gonna be able to see my slide. Uh, go ahead, and, uh, my trusty assistant, uh, thank you. Next. Um, uh, by the way, the older I get, the more that I think is important are fairly obvious things. So here's a, so a taxonomy. Here's a way of looking at uh, some of the national security uh, threats facing us. Uh, probably the most important thing about this thing uh, is to list at the top of the, the threats that you and I got to think about and deal with is weapons of mass destruction. There is no politician, there's no Air Force four-star general or Navy admiral that wants to be known as the lead on WMD. It has gone out of favor. Uh, the U.S. Senate, we're not modernizing and investing in these uh, deterrent capabilities. Uh, we, had a, we have a broken intellectual model where for two and a half generations we understood how to stabilize deterrence with the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. Those errors are gone, and yet a year ago we signed a major treaty with the, uh, with the Russian Federation. Complete nonsense. Uh, they can, the biggest security challenge we have with the Russians is can we force them to safeguard their weapons? Can we get drunk Russian Air Force majors uh, away from uh, weapons that may not have Serial numbers on them, PAL unlock device, uh, two-man control, uh, etc. Uh, the, so the Russians, in my view, do not represent a continuing nuclear threat to the United States, except control their fissile material number one, their warts number two. And um, but what does occur in most of us is when you look out at that global community, there must be 30 nations that could go nuclear rapidly. It isn't too hard to do. 
The only tough challenge is developing fissile material. And by the way, if somebody will give it to you, or sell it to you, or you can steal it, if you can get 40 kilograms of high-grade HEU, uh, a third-tier physics laboratory can make a nuclear device. We're going to see these things proliferate in the coming year. And even worse, if I grab 10 of us in the room as a committee and said, let's go build three radiological devices this year for sure, particularly if you gave me a modest budget, five, ten million dollars, we come back at the end of the year with three devices that'll work. They won't kill a lot of people. They might kill 100, 200 people, but I'll bet you could get them to detonate in three cities and do a 50 billion dollar uh, damage to the U.S. economy and maybe evacuate major cities like New York or Washington or San Francisco. Nobody's talking about this issue. We're not investing the money in it. And by the way, one of the hardest things for me to tell people in public and, and get them to listen to it is, one key to it is without question U.S. nuclear strike capability. If that uh, capability isn't widely believed to be valid, to be modernized, to be safe, uh, then it will disappear as a way to keep the peace. Um, you know, I, I, occasionally we have some goofy uh, Air Force four-star who will drink deeply from the chalice of love and peace and he'll say, we ought to go to one nuclear device or a hundred of them or give them to the Vatican and they can hold the key or whatever. <laughs> and uh, I would argue that step one to massive proliferation. That's the point at which the Iranians say, hey, if we got a hundred of these devices, we can counter these people in a variety of ways. I think it adds to proliferation. Second piece of keeping the peace on WMD, it seems to me, is building anti-ballistic missile defense. And there's no champions in uniform, uh, or for that matter, in, in, in the media for that approach. It's widely believed to be technically infeasible. Uh, the, you know, the, the military services look at their modernization budgets and say, if we're putting, a, you know, 100 billion a year into uh, ABM, we're not going to be able to achieve our own service goals. We got to think about this. We just watched Iron Dome, which is a tiny problem compared to the problem defending the United States from an Iranian or North Korean uh, strike uh, pay for itself in, in the space of the, the confrontation with, uh, with Gaza last week. Now, you look at some of the others, you know, a couple of the earlier speakers made a pretty good job talking through the sort of the, the extent of the uh, the threats we're facing. I always add in humanitarian crisis and refugees. You know, the bottom line is when, when we have a major disaster, uh, you start looking for institutions that are capable of heavy loads, you end up with the National Guard. That's it, and the active military. And the active military normally isn't postured or equipped or frequently stationed to immediately respond. Uh, so, you know, one of my slides later on, you're going to hear me make an argument that the National Guard is probably well under-resourced, too small, and in some ways still fighting for a place at the high-intensity warfare uh, mission instead of uh, understanding we need military police brigades, medical units, signal, uh, devices that will assist governors and regional uh, response to homeland security disasters. I think at some point, certainly after 9-11 we could have done it, uh, we would probably need reintroduction of the draft for the National Guard. Not for the active forces. Canadians did this in World War II. Basically the draft brought kids into the military. They had to be volunteers to fight uh, foreign wars. But at some point, we've got to have, it seems to me, large institutions uh, with the equipment, the training, and the discipline to respond in, in uh, major emergencies. Um, okay, next. Um, uh, the whole series of them here, you know, we, we, sorry, the, the last one I listed was military force. And one of the problems with military power, when you employ it, you are never sure how it's going to turn out. You've got thinking adaptive enemies uh, one of the best books, if you haven't uh, ever read it, uh, We Were Soldiers Once and Young, uh, Galloway and Moore. Jot yourself a note. It's one of the top five books ever written about warfare uh, in English. Powerful. 
It was the Adrang battle uh, in Vietnam in 1965 where you have the most powerful military in the face of the earth, the U.S., that had just won World War II a few years earlier. And they're facing a bunch of ragtag uh, rebels armed with automatic weapons and light mortars. Uh, they came into the Adrang and the 7th Cavalry, I commanded a company in uh, the 7th Cavalry in Vietnam, took the highest level of casualties in combat in four days of any unit since the Civil War of American Ar Army Infantry Regiments. And by the way, the North Vietnamese, uh, who had defeated the French and eaten them alive at the Nguyen Bien Phu, uh, suddenly realized what they were up against. Uh, miscalculation in the use of military power is commonplace. I, you know, it's terribly uneasy. Marty Dempsey, the chairman of JCS, a good guy, a smart guy, uh, talking about the Iranians a, a few months ago, said, well, we can depend upon them to be logical. Oh, not so. Not so. Uh, that's where a lot of these uh, combat situations develop, people not thinking through uh, the next uh, uh, step to uh, these issues. Um, I guess a couple of other quick comments. Uh, bullet number three is an important one to me. I was an arms control negotiation, uh, negotiator for Bush 41. Uh, Ash Carter, Steve Hadley, <coughs> Paul Wolfowitz, and I were uh, trying to get nukes out of the former Soviet Union states. If you want to do away with military power, the best thing to do is arms control agreements, not bomb them. You know, we got the Iranian programs primarily uh, through a UN agency, not through air power. Uh, so it has to be a, an integral part of how we defend America. Next. Um, I spent a lot of time talking to state legislatures. Uh, I guess, Rodney, you used my 85%. You know, part of our challenge in the United States Homeland Security is nobody's in charge, and we like it that way. Uh, we've got this short constitution. It's now the oldest document, constitutional document, in the face of the earth. And it has divided government and federal government and autonomy of local institutions. Uh, one of the great contributions uh, of fusion centers, arguably, was to take a, uh, a society where we don't like hierarchical organizations and allow them to communicate. By the way, communication is only one piece of it. One of, the, one of the great teaching points I think we've run into in Department of Defense in the last, uh, since World War II, remember Dr. Bill Perry, mathematics PhD, little quiet, humble, uh, man, Secretary of Defense, uh, just an uh, incredible public servant. Uh, years ago, it must have been mm, probably the, the, the mid-90s, uh, in broad daylight, we had an air exclusion zone over northern Iraq, and uh, two U.S. Air Force F-15s with an AWACS aircraft operating in broad daylight shot down two U.S. Army Black Hawk helicopters killing everybody aboard. And we went back and did an autopsy on it. It's just hard to imagine. The AWACS, uh, you can run LaGuardia Airport uh, out of it. Uh, it's just remarkable. You can land planes on an aircraft carrier 100 miles away in zero visibility weather with an AWACS. And here we shot down a uh, friendly blue-on-blue -blue, uh, incident. As we started unraveling it, uh, and this is a challenge to New Jersey. By the way, let me reiterate though, New Jersey is well in advance of most of the country in a whole series of issues. But as we started to unravel this, we said, you know, a plan has primary value only for the people that wrote it. And then you have to rehearse it and exercise it. And it's sort of like walking. If you end up in a hospital bed, which I've spent a lot of time in, at the end of three days, if you suddenly stand up, your muscles have forgotten how to walk yourself. Uh, and I feel when you start looking at plans, if you're not rehearsing in some way, tabletop, uh, CPX, MAPX, uh, walking through as senior leaders only, uh, if you're not doing that, your plan won't work. It doesn't exist. And by the way, the second problem is, when you're looking around the room, you're having your tabletop exercise, 
If it's only the 24-year-old guy or gal with a high IQ, the weird kid in some other part of the organization, who does that stuff, not me. I'm too important. If your principles aren't part of the rehearsal, it won't work when the crisis happens. So another challenge, protecting U.S. infrastructure, looking at that mass out there, we've got a lot of work to do. We're not where we need to be. You've got to start with a realistic assessment of the threat as it actually exists. Then you've got to say, rationally, what are our vulnerabilities? And when I say our, I don't mean the state, the nation. I mean an entity, the port of, Newark, uh, of uh, Los Angeles, uh, an airport in Newark. You've got to sit down and analyze the real vulnerabilities. Then you've got to say, realistically, what can I afford to do? And then you've got to implement it. That may be more technology than manpower, I would argue, more intelligence uh, than barbed wire fences. Uh, and by the way, you've got to have somebody pay for it. The feds aren't going to pay for it. <coughs> you've got to go out to your client and say, look, it's going to cost you an additional 6%, and you ought to be happy about that because we're going to give you a great degree of assurity uh, that your people won't get killed or your business ruined. You've got to get out there and protect you as critical infrastructure. Next. Um, <clears throat> I've only got one complaint about American soldiers. If you don't shoot at them for three days in a row, they stop being scared. It, it's just astonishing. And the same thing about the American people. I go to, uh, I go to editorial boards now, and uh, there's a suspicion, I think, sometimes in the room that I'm flogging the terrorist threat to continue the funding uh, for some institutional purpose. <clears throat> Instead of saying, wait a minute, you know, there's capabilities out there to attack us, we've got to create systems of defense and, and, and keep them operative. 9-11 is a long time ago. 9-11, the biggest loss of life since the Battle of Antietam. It shocked the living bejabers out of us. Uh, we've got to remind the American people, right of boom, where's the fear, what will it look like? Uh, we've got to, in my view, create the infrastructure, <clears throat> the institution needed to deal with it. Next. Uh, we can talk about Afghanistan. My son just came out of his latest combat tour there. It's a mess. Too bad. Uh, the Afghans are phenomenal people. They're survivors. They're terrific businessmen. They're great students. Uh, they're terrific soldiers. There's no lack of courage. Uh, but there's an intense ethnic civil war going on in Afghanistan. Uh, and it's come upon, it's now two generations of mayhem. It is pathetic. And right in the middle of it's this giant drug enterprise. You know, you fly into Kandahar, Helmand provinces during the opium growing season, it's like Kansas wheat fields. It's well over 90% of the world's total production of opiates are coming out of this one country. It's fueling international crime. It's fueling addiction inside Afghanistan. Maybe a million people addicted. It's, it's contrary to Islam in every way. Uh, you know, you've got Masri Sharif with multi-story buildings with central air conditioning and underground parking and traffic jams in Kabul with a Bentley driving around uh, Kabul while I was there. The preposterous. You know, what do you think fueling that? Stupid tourism? Uh, it's a drug trade. And you've got people coming across the border with encrypted telecommunications and brand new sniper rifles and wearing REI camping gear. It's a, sort of this a convergence of international crime, the drug industry, and terrorism. And sometimes you peel back the layers. You know, the guy says, I'm an ideologue, I'm a Marxist, I'm a socialist, I'm a member of the FARC, I'm fighting for the people, but the behavior of many of these institutions is criminal in nature. And they're so sophisticated uh, that they can hire international law firms and public relations firms uh, and do, and they don't corrupt a judge, they buy a block of voters in a national legislature. So this is a threat unlike anything we've encountered in the past. Uh, next. Uh, I got, it's four or five slides on Iran. I, I think I'm going to move, just move through that and tell you that one of the problems is we fight places uh, for principles where we have no national security interests at stake almost at all. Libya, one of the more comical interventions we've conducted. 
But we did it for principled reasons, to save the people of Benghazi from being annihilated by this monster, the Gaddafi uh, family. Uh, there was nothing at stake there for us. Uh, and by the way, we barely pulled it off, and so we stood behind, you know, the, the heroes of the air campaign were the Danes. They haven't hurt anybody in 500 years, for God's sake. Uh, so, Libya. But when it comes to the Persian Gulf, the GCC states, Saudi Arabia, you mark my word, you know, there's, I'm not talking about a secret war plan. We will fight without question if the Persian Gulf uh, gets closed. Uh, I don't think, when you look at that situation, that um, the, the Israelis are going to do a, a strike on the, uh, on the Iranian nuclear production facility. It doesn't make any sense to me. By the way, we shouldn't either. Military power, conventional military power, is not the tool to resolve that. It's walling them off, applying sanctions, and waiting them out, and organizing their neighbors to understand that they're more at risk than we are. Five years from now, for sure, guarantee it, the Iranians will have 30 nukes and delivery systems. And the, the region will be immensely uh, more tense. And the Israelis will be on a hair trigger response. Uh, and if there's a miscalculation, you know, if there's an attack on a U.S. carrier battle group and we lose 5,000 sailors, somebody like me will walk into the President of the United States watching their nukes go to H-1 and holding and recommend a preemptive nuclear strike and will do it. So the question is, what do you do now to avoid a disaster for the region and indeed for the global community? It's a tough situation. There's no easy answers. Uh, the Iranians, half of them are Shia, uh, or excuse me, are uh, Persians. Half of them are every other wandering tribe in the region. They basically, uh, the young people are disgusted with the uh, dictatorship they're living under. Uh, but I do not believe uh, that, uh, that, that Iran is likely to be dissuaded from going a nuclear route in the coming years. I think they're going to go nukes. We're going to have to do things like build a sea-based anti-ballistic missile defense system, which I think is the direction we're going in. Um, they have giant armed forces. It isn't very good, uh, but it is good enough, I think, to close the Persian Gulf uh, for probably 30, 45 days, uh, following which it would be a major uh, conventional war. Nick? Um, this just reiterates some of that. Their Navy, uh, sometimes we miss, we underestimate uh, what we're facing, by the way. I've had a Navy four-star uh, try and choke me like a rubber chicken over, uh, you know, the notion they could close the Persian Gulf. They've got terrible platforms, but very sophisticated munitions. So they've invested a lot of money in the uh, really cutting-edge technology, a lot of it out from the Russians on mine warfare as an example or shore-based uh, missile batteries. They're going to be very tough to find and to deal with. Next. Uh, Air Force. Nobody can deal with the U.S. Air Force and U.S. Naval Air. Can't be done. Uh, it's a fool's errand to try. You shouldn't spend money trying to do it. Everybody does. Uh, their special ops capability, big problem. <clears throat> New Jersey will see Cuds Force operatives if we go to war with Iran. And by the way, this coming fall, uh, the Obama team is going to be under tremendous pressure to back up their rhetoric that they won't allow Iran to develop a nuclear device. I think they're going to do it. I don't think it can be stopped. Um, and I would argue profoundly against the use of U.S. conventional military power uh, to stop them from gaining that capability. They've got chemicals. Uh, they've got probable unclassified biological warfare capability. They've got a lot of long-range missiles. Next. Uh, they're really doing. You know, I watched this deal with North Korea for years. We, you know, when you face a problem, it's almost uh, intractable to deal with. Uh, the best solution is don't see the problem, and that's what we're doing with Iran. They are going nuke. It's not that hard to do, and I think in a short run they'll achieve their purpose. Next, um, the only important bullet one is the last one: miscalculation. Uh, this is a time for diplomacy for measured responses, for private communication. One of our challenges is we can't keep a secret more than an hour and a half. Uh, we've got to communicate with these people. Uh, one of the ways we've got the nukes out of the former Soviet Union states 
uh, was at, you know, Steve Hadley and I would go in and we'd grab all the generals and put them in a room and say, hey, you trust these politicians with nuclear devices. The Ukrainians had dozens of long-range ICBMs and nuclear warheads. Generals say, of course not. They're all corrupt and incompetent. We go to the politicians and say, you trust these fat, drunken generals and admirals uh, with nuclear devices. Of course not. He said, well, good, then you ought to get rid of them because you're raising your insecurity profile by having them. Uh, we got to worry about Iranian miscalculation. Next. Mexico, wonderful country, a tremendous uh, economic power. Our oil and gas comes from Canada, Mexico, Venezuela, U.S. production, and increasingly, by the way, from Colombia, uh, some from Ecuador. Uh, we're also headed in the right direction <clears throat> on energy, uh, but Mexico is important to us. You know, 2,000 mile border, the people within 50 miles of that border on either side like each other a lot better than they do their national capitals. Uh, they don't want to see the border walled off. They don't want to see, uh, you know, 2,000 miles of, of uh, fence. I personally am persuaded you got to fence the U.S. frontier. And, you know, I found in, I did a study at the state of Texas. And one of the ranchers said, uh, son, you ever seen us try and hold cows in with a virtual fence? Uh, it doesn't work. You actually have to put up a fence, and then you have to do two things at the same time. You got to fence the border, and you got to create a system where Mexican labor that is desperately needed in this country. You now, if we rounded up the 12 million or more illegals uh, here in this country, wrapped them in duct tape, and shipped them back where they came from our economy would collapse. They grow our food for us. They run the restaurants and daycare centers. They're buying uh, dry cleaners. They're voting. They're becoming citizens. What are we thinking of? You gotta allow people to come into the country, work, and wire their money home to their mother. My grandparents, both sets, came in in the early part of the uh, 20th century down at Ellis Island from Ireland. They arrived drunk and they did okay. What the heck are we thinking? <laughs> okay, next. Uh, yeah, it's a big problem. You know, uh, basically, I think the number I'm using now is there's something like 280, uh, 30 cities in the United States where the principal organized crime threat is Mexican cartels. And they're the cruelest people on the face of the earth. You turn around and look at Mexico, and these are unclassified government, U.S. government numbers I use. Look back into Mexico and <clears throat> maybe you got just short of a thousand local governments that are controlled by criminal organizations. The Mexicans know I'm their friend. I'm on an international advisory panel the Mexican Federal Police, uh, but it drives them crazy when I make comments like this. Mexico is in trouble. It's going to get worse, not better. Uh, the new administration gets sworn in on 1 December. What will happen? You know, the Mexican people don't want, do want the rule of law, don't want to be ruled by criminal organizations, but they're sick of the bloodshed. And they don't think the Calderon administration was winning. So they admired the aim, but they were discouraged by the results. Next. Uh, well, 52,000 murdered, who knows what it is. It's now probably 56, 58,000, uh, 3, 4 percent of the entire GNP. Uh, were it not for the Mexican Marines, number one, and the Mexican Army, that country would be a failed state. They're trying to build a federal police force, build federal prisons, uh, put together institutions that will protect their people. They're humble, they're spiritual, they're hardworking, they don't, they don't want to live in this kind of environment. There's no justice in Mexico at all. Chance of being, a, you know, committing murder and being arrested, prosecuted, and jailed are almost zero. Next. Here's a sort of a closing slide. And I show this uh, and tell people it's a bad news slide for American democracy. Uh, it's been going on since Vietnam, an increasing disenchantment of the American people their own institutions. And by the way, this is just a snapshot that comes out every June. Uh, Congress is down around 9% right now. Uh, the president, I think, is up to 48% or 49%. There's only two institutions in U.S. society that are largely trusted by all people, law enforcement and U.S. armed forces. 
there's a reason for that too. It isn't the you know the senior leadership. It's uh, the boys and girls in the in the armed forces write their mom and dad and say, I'm part of an institution of integrity and courage, and they care about me as a person, and they're developing me as a person, and they expect the same thing out of most law enforcement in the United States. We have a uh, we got a challenge in the coming years to try and regain some sense of how governance should work in America, and right now it's sadly in peril. And by the way, some of these problems we face aren't too hard to figure out. You know, you grab uh, Tom O'Reilly and tell him to take 10 people and have five work days, and he come up with a white paper on how to solve social security. You know, I work with a large engineering firm. We routinely design complex bridges and tunnels and airports, and social security is only three variables. You know, you get more money or less money, you get it later or earlier, you can pay more or less, that's it. You know, you can get a high option, a medium, and a low. You just got to pick one and go out and gain consensus from the American people. And the, the same thing happens with immigration reform, uh, entitlement programs, you name it. Most of them aren't too hard to think out, but they require consensus and rational uh, thought, uh, particularly in Congress, I think is lacking. So on that note, um, you know, you paid a lot more attention to me than my family does. Thank <laughs> you.